Also at Camcon Europe 2023 we have many interviews for you in store. Today on display GHS and CLP. GHS provides a basis for harmonization of rules and regulations on chemicals at a global level. In today's interview we will take a closer look into the various GHS building blocks that countries can select. Including the new hazard classes that are part of the EU CLP revision like endocrine disruptors and the mobility of substances. Paul Ryan from the European Chemicals Agency and Daniel Rios of Givaudan will provide us a window to the world of GHS and CLP. Daniel, you are currently the chair of ICCA's GHS workgroup. Can you share how this workgroup operates? Thank you for your question, Thierry. Um, the International Council of Chemical Associations organizes working group to coordinate contributions from this, uh, the industry experts in those uh, fields uh, and also to consolidate our comments from the industry uh, and contribute to the UNJGS subcommittee of experts. As you know, we have you now two meetings each year and the idea is that the industry can better contribute to those meetings and also now with the discussions around the potential hazard issues that are uh, part of the UNJGS mandate they could uh, better contribute with the comments from industry. Okay, thank you. Paul, in addition to the GHS building blocks, the EU has added some new bricks via CLP. Can you tell us more about the recent CLP revision and the deadlines? Of course. Um, so since April this year, we have new hazard classes. We have endocrine disruptors for human health and the environment. We have PBTs and VPVPs which is very persistent, very bioaccumulative, or persistent bioaccumulative and toxic. We also have PMTs and VPVMs, which is persistent mobile and toxic, or very mobile and very persistent. Um, so these hazard classes are in place since April, like I said. Um, some of this is new uh, in terms of where it has been before. We have endocrine disruptor category two, which is a new uh, territory. Uh, mobility is new. Uh, and the move across to CLP, of course, is new. Uh, you asked about deadlines. So the deadlines, there are many, uh, depending on whether it's a substance or a mixture, and dependent on whether it's your substance is on the market already or not. Uh, I'll pick out a few. So for substances, the deadline is November 2026 uh, for substances already on the market. And for mixtures, it's May 2028 for mixtures already on the market. But more information is on our website if you want to check the details. Already 20 years ago, the first edition of GHS was published. This year, we have the 10th revised edition. What were the key reasons to start GHS and what were the main adaptations over time? And at that time, of course, there was a need, obvious need for a standard for chemical safety. There's not only the only reason, uh, other reason was also because, as you know, trade, uh, the global uh, trade of chemicals is really global and there is a, a very complex um, supply chain. So it was needed at that time uh, to create uh, that standard also for trade reasons. Hey, and there's also news that there will be changes to the classification and labeling inventory. What is planned in this regard? Yeah, we have, we have plans ongoing. We have, people are probably well aware that the, the inventory is quite a used resource. We have thousands of visitors every day to the website. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback over the years in terms of how we could improve it. So this is in the plans for, for quite soon. We're going to revamp the whole interface. Uh, the inventory should be better integrated with other data that we share on the website. So we'll get a lot of benefits from, from the change. Also in the CLP revision, there's uh, from the Commission's proposal at least a, an initiative to clarify or simplify when there's divergences in self-classification. So this can be catered for in the revamp. So uh, sometime next year, we'll have a brand new, brand new tool and a better user-friendly user, user -friendly tool. And you will wait for the Commission's proposal or you revamp anyway? Revamp anyway, but it should cater for, for what the Commission intends to do if that is the final uh, settling point for the CLP revision. Yeah. Okay. In many REACH dossiers said there's no data yet about endocrine disrupting properties. Is there enough data available or can it be generated to meet this first deadline of 26 or 28? Yeah, what I would say is maybe we have been identifying endocrine disruptors already for some time under SVHC process, so substance is a very high concern under REACH uh, with existing data. 
borrowing from standardized studies, also from open literature and so on and so forth. So we have a proven system that works to an extent. It's not the full package. I know the commission is looking at this in terms of what uh, could be added to information requirements across REACH to give a better total, total uh, coverage of, of the endocrine disruptors. Okay. Daniel, it's always great, and eh? new requirements. What are the challenges for companies to implement new hazard glasses globally? Obviously, there is a, a need uh, for the companies to invest in, in science, invest in capacity building of uh, their staff, of course. There is also a need of revising uh, their portfolios to see how this can impact themselves. And obviously, true, um, if there is such impact, they need to update STS and, and labels and all this, their systems. So um, it's a great effort uh, in terms of uh, cost, in terms of training of the, as I said, of the training of their staff. And what is expected um, uh, of the impact of the PBT and VPVP uh, criteria from REIT now being part of CLP? Such a large impact, you no know, downstream uh, of such uh, regulation such as CLP, also REIT, of course. Um, we understand that it to be a challenge for many aspects. Uh, for testing, for example, there is a challenge to, that we ensure that we have tests available and also have non-animal testing available. So there's a lot of things that will you know, be triggered by these changes. Hey, let's move to the mobility of substances. In 2019, the German Umweltbundesamt eh, performed an impact assessment of the PMT and the VPV. M criteria. They concluded that the introduction of these criteria would only impact a minor portfolio of REACH registered substances and that it would have a relatively small impact on the European chemical industry as a whole. Do you recognize this? In, in a way I do. I mean, if you take the whole portfolio or the whole database of REACH substances, a small subset of that will have potentially persistent properties or, or persistent properties a smaller subset of that, again, might be mobile. So it is, if you take the whole REACH database as the, the yardstick, it will be a smaller uh, part, of the, part of the substances, but a quite important one. These are substances that persist in the environment. Uh, they end up in places where they shouldn't. So it's important that they're addressed and it's quite a significant change, I think. So a quite an important one. Yeah, so those are the globally moving substances, basically, exactly. Eh, exactly. to stay in the topic of the interview. Um, Daniel, are there certain industries more affected by this new COP revision, or...? Yeah, it's a difficult question for me, because uh, to have such a broad assessment, uh, I think uh, we don't have data to, to say that. It's, um, it's a challenge, and of course, it will take time for us to understand the whole impact on industry. As we already mentioned, Daniel, we're having the 10th anniversary edition, eh? so after 20 years. Can you sketch a little bit roughly around the globe um, how far the implementation process is? Sure, Tia. Yeah, um, the implementation has uh, evolved during the, all those 20 years. The first 10 years were when the, the, the players, the, the leading players, such as EU and, and US and Japan, implemented uh, JGS in the regulations. And then I think the last 10 years, um, other countries have joined uh, this group of, of uh, countries with JGS. Now we have around 60 countries with JGS regulations. Of course, some are more complex, uh, some are evolving, and, and for example, now we have US in Canada going to uh, update for the 7th, 8th, 8th edition. We have also uh, Brazil with the 7th edition. And we have seen uh, all the Asian countries with different time, time frames, but also uh, evolving and updating the regulation. So uh, this will continue. But it's also one of the challenges and one of the, the things that make it difficult because if you had less updates, maybe it would be easier to follow with those uh, updates. If you have like each two years, it's really difficult for the, the countries to cope with that pace. So maybe it's a, one of the open questions, how this will evolve along the, the next years and how this could be more pragmatic and, and try to narrow the difference between countries. Okay, final question. What do you think makes GHS and COP a success? I think having a, having a harmonized system for hazard, 
across Europe and globally brings a lot of things. It brings predictability, uh, transparency in decisions that are made. It allows all parties to prepare and map out what's, what's coming. So industry, regulators, uh, sta all stakeholders. Um, Daniel? As I said um, in the other question, um, CLP has replaced a previous regulation for the EU. So it brings a lot of uh, experience, practical experience from the EU countries and the EU uh, authorities and industry uh, to JGS. And I think this practical experience and in leading this process, of course, brings a lot of uh, benefits. And of course, LP is a reference everywhere. I mean, and, uh, and LP is a reference for the countries who are building the regulation. Daniel and Paul, thank you very much for providing us a window to the world of GHS and CLP. Even after two decades, GHS is far from window dressing. It's still very relevant and useful. And I expect that the EU CLP revision is another useful brick in the wall. <laughs>